Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And today I will try to convey to you the essence of what we call object-oriented programming. OOP, which is short for object-oriented programming, is a methodology to code a programs. A program is composed of two things, data and operations that run on this data. Some programming languages put much emphasis on the operations, meaning that most of the reasoning about the program is spent on the craft and combination of operations. These are the procedural and functional programming languages. In these languages, programmers write code by thinking about which operations make up this code. These operations have different names depending on which community is talking about them. We can call them functions, procedures, routines, and so forth. And there are programming languages that put much emphasis on the data. This data is what we usually call objects. In truth, there is not really a consensus on what is the essence of object-oriented programming. However, programming languages that are usually called object-oriented have a few common characteristics. The first of these characteristics is this view of the data as an entity able to answer messages. Then we have late binding, that is, the possibility of associ associating a, uh, a program symbol, I mean a name, with an implementation during the execution of the program. In other words, the implementation of a given operation can be determined only during the execution of the program and not at completion time. Another common characteristic of these languages is the presence of a form of polymorphism called subtyping, which is a bit of a consequence of the data answering messages and being late bound. And we can see this data as persisting over time, much beyond the life of the function that has created it. These characteristics are common to languages where object orientation is natural. Note that we have not mentioned classes, for instance. Not every object-oriented program language uses classes. Same applies to inheritance, of course. There are languages that fit very well in the OO model and that do not provide inheritance. Let's go over these characteristics of object-oriented programs. Let's start with messages. I mean to say that objects, that is data, are responsive entities. In other words, data in the object-oriented paradigm can answer messages. This aspect of OOP, I mean the fact that data responds to messages, is so important that Alan Kay once said that the paradigm should be called message-oriented and not object-oriented. But what are these messages then? Let's create an object here. I shall be using some random syntax in the examples. I want the program language to be material to the discussion. I want to talk about characteristics of object-oriented programming that would be present in any programming language where object orientation would be natural. Anyways, we can think about objects as state machines, that is, as bundles of data that can be transformed by different kinds of stimuli. These stimuli are the messages. The rest of the program uses messages to interact with objects. Today, we call these messages methods. Some methods, like exempt below, let us ask questions to objects. We can ask the object something about its internal state. And the object knows how to answer. It answers by giving us data back. And other messages let us change the state of the object. After the object acts upon the message, it might have a different state, that is, the values that constitute it might have changed. We can also send messages with arguments. These are the parameters of the methods. 
but the fact that the object knows how to answer messages. By looking into objects as entities able to answer messages, we are humanizing them. I mean, we see the object as capable of taking actions. The set knows how to remove something from itself or how to tell if it's apt or not. In other words, the messages that the object recognizes determine the set of actions that an object of that type can perform. And the type of the object is thus determined by the set of its capabilities. The object is, in essence, the concretization of an abstract data type. Notice that this notion of type as determined by the set of messages that an object can answer is valid in a language with a static type discipline, like Java or C Sharp. But it also applies to a language with a dynamic type system, in which the type of an object will only be known at ru running time, like Python or JavaScript. So the messages of an object form up what we can call its type, but how the object answer to this message is determined by its dynamic type, which is only defined at execution time. We call this type dynamic exactly because it will be defined at runtime. This property of defining dyna the dynamic type of an object consists in associating an object with an implementation of the interface that it defines. This associ association at runtime is called late binding. Late binding means that the actual implementation of the symbol that represents an object will be decided only when the program runs. Notice that we can have several possible implementations that can be bound to an object. Not at the same time, I mean, the object will refer to only one implementation at a given time, but it can refer to different implementations at different points of the execution of the program. This brings us to another key characteristic of object-oriented languages, a kind of polymorphism called subtyping. Subtyping means that in any situation in which we expect a type we can receive a subtype of that type. In other words, we can bind an object to an instance of a subtype of its base type. As an example, this function inspect can receive instance of hash set or instance of tree set because both these types are subtypes of the set type. Any instance of a hash set, for instance, knows how to answer any message that can be sent to a, to a set. Notice that this discussion also applies to a dynamically typed language like Python, where duck typing assumes the role of subtyping. This principle that we can pass a subtype whenever we expect a type is called the Liskov substitution principle after Barbara Liskov who worked on the language um, CLO, for instance, and did many other things in computer science. And talking about uh, functions, we arrive at the last key characteristic of object-oriented programming, the persistence of data. I mean to say that objects persist over time, possibly longer than the functions that have created them. If you remember, a program is formed by data and operations. Data is created by operations, but when we put emphasis on the data, it's natural to imagine that data will outlive the operation that has created it. By outliving, I mean to say that, for instance, the activation of an operation has a certain lifetime. This lifetime starts when I invoke the operation, and it ends when this operation returns. Data also has a lifetime. The lifetime of an object starts when the object is created. In Java and in C++, that happens via the new operation. And it ends when the object is deleted. In C++, for instance, we can delete an object explicitly. In other languages like Java, the space occupied by the object can be reclaimed 
by a garbage collector. Thus, an object can be created by a function and escape it. For instance, when a function returns an object, in this case, the object will continue existing after the function returns. And an object can enter the activation of a function that will take care of deleting it, for instance. And in between its creation and its finalization, an object can have its state changed by different functions. The fact that objects might outlive the functions that have created them imply that objects cannot be allocated on the stack. Together with the activation record of functions, they are located on the heap, which is a memory region that holds data that may escape the activation of functions. So, summing it up, we have seen that object-oriented languages in general have data that can answer messages, that persists over time and that's late bound. And all that leads to a kind of polymorphism called subtyping. And with that, we have pretty much what we call object orientation. It does not really seem like a lot, but this combination of late binding, subtyping, messages and persistency leads to a very rich and complex programming paradigm which we call object-oriented programming. So thank you for watching.